technological cheesecloth that says, this is a cheesecloth right here, it looks kind of flimsy. You take and you wrap it around a ball of cheese and you can separate the curd from the whey and you can squeeze it and tighten it up and, and the whey will drip out and separate the curd. You can uh, look at that if you'd like while I'm talking. Let me explain what a technological cheesecloth is. When I was 22 years old, someone put a hammer in my hand. And with all the determination and vision that only the youth possess, after hammering in my first nail, I determined that if I put all my focus on that, that I could build things. And over the next several years, I worked as a carpenter and a plaster and a cement finisher and a plumber and a roofer and a gardener. At night, I studied architecture and engineering and city planning and building codes and urban design. And I built a lot of nice things. And I came to believe that a, a building, particularly a home, is a representation of the relationship between people and the world around them. And I got an offer to work in big time construction by a commercial builder. And I worked my way up that ladder. And so about 15 years after someone first put a hammer in my hand, I was the corporate construction manager of New Apple Computer Headquarters, $22 million project in Cupertino, California. And uh, after I finished building that, that's, a, that's, a, that's that project on the top there. After I finished building that, I realized that all the things I loved about building, working with my hands, and the relationship between the world around us and people, and how a building represents that, had been lost. And instead, what I was building was what I considered to be big, ugly glass, steel, and concrete boxes that closed people in and separated them from the world around them. And so I got back on that ladder and I started climbing down, get back to that world that I loved. It took me another 15 years before I reached the bottom of that ladder, but I had to go to the middle of Southern Africa to do that. And I bought a farm at the edge of the Kalahari Desert, and I was able to spend some time with the people that lived there, the bushmen of the Kalahari. And I went foraging with them, learned how to find roots. How to build a snare to trap small animals. It doesn't mm, eat it. Yeah. When he quit. We did a lot of hunting and. In return, I taught them how to shoot an elephant gun, though we didn't shoot the elephants. Side on the shoulder. Push forward. And pull the trigger. Fire. No, yes, I don't. Oh, you. And uh, we celebrated the hunt. And I learned about their culture. And so. I realized that how different our culture was from them. And you know, the word culture is, a, is an interesting word. It has uh, 164 different meanings, according to one researcher. Everything from classical culture, classical art, classical music, to the Bushman culture, to uh, what they call an Zenic culture, when we grow microorganisms in a petri dish. That picture on the right there. And you eliminate all of the things that uh, might just disrupt that in particular species and you give it everything it needs to survive. And so I came to look at culture in a different way. And the Bushman culture is really simple. It's an animal, vegetable, mineral world where they hunt and gather and their lives are about food and shelter and art or different other forms of expression and entertainment. And I recognize that when civilization came from when we were able to domesticate animals and plants and ranching and farming replaced hunting and gathering. And now we live in an urban society. But it's not the same kind of culture. This web of processes where we turn that natural world into the things that we use and need 
is extremely complex. We have industries that extract raw materials, and then they ship things all over the world to refineries and mills, and then they ship things all over the world to factories, and then to wholesalers, and then to retailers, and then we walk into a store and it's there as if it appeared by magic, not recognizing that everything that we do and buy has an impact pack on the world. And that's what I call the technological cheesecloth. And that cheesecloth is wrapped around this globe. And it's putting tremendous pressure on the world's resources. And it's starting to break in different places. And there's a limit to how much pressure it can put. There's an earth between that technological cheesecloth. And everything that we do impacts it. As just one example, uh, if you're using an iPod, the plastics in it might have come from corn grown in the United States, and the coltan that's used, that's necessary for it, might come from the Congo where there's a war being fought over coltan. And then it might all be shipped to, to uh, Asia to be processed and then back to the United States. And all of this involves energy and transportation and cost, and it all impacts the world. And so there's a massive loss of biodiversity, a massive disruption of Earth systems, global climate change, a massive concentration of wealth, because all of these natural resources that we use to make the world we live in is turned into things that are bought and sold and bought and sold and bought and sold, and somehow, almost by an invisible hand, the money gets moved up to the top. And it's created a bifurcation in perception because we don't see that world. We don't see the impact that our lifestyles are having on that world. But everything that we do has an impact on that world. And you can think of it, a good way to think of it, the way I think of it, is a, uh, a standard bell curve. And the more complex that, that cheesecloth becomes, and these processes become, that there's an inverse effect on the planet. And if there are any statisticians here, but this is the Gaussian function, and as it gets more intense, I would imagine that there is a relationship that could be explored between um, loss of biodiversity and urbanization. And I'll bet that there are statistics to back that up, but nobody is talking about that. And so, when we look at our culture, now, it's less and less like a traditional classical culture, not at all like an urban culture, but in fact, it's much like an azenic culture. Because what we've done is we've eliminated everything that might threaten a human being. And we provide ourselves with everything we need. And most of it is just about stimulating our minds. And that's what life is becoming. It's becoming a place where we stimulate our minds. And some people, don't even want to have anything to do with the natural world, and they'd be happy if it was a, just a cyber world. Turn the whole planet into a cyber planet, stimulate our minds, and everyone will be happy. Well, I don't buy it. It's madness. But we're all caught in this web. We are all forced by economic realities to be part of this system. And the message that we're getting is that if we break through to the top of this world, we can be free and do whatever we want, and it has no impact on the world, and that's simply not true. It's pure fantasy. And the three talking points that play, take place in this world are, what might a perfect world be like? How might we create that world? But more and more, people want to know what amuses them. They're always looking for something that's clever or amusing. Do we have a choice? Yes, we do. We have a choice not so much in how we employ ourselves, we're all forced to be part of that cheese block, but we have a choice in how we spend our free time. And I'm going to close with a couple of short videos that I spliced together. And one was made about 40 years ago, and the other was made earlier this year. And it might look like they don't relate to one another, but to me they relate to one another completely. But I'll leave it to you to decide. The madness is back. It's March, and the nation has gone mad. 
Nearly 140 million people tune in to see the biggest basketball tournament on the planet. And the current contract for March Madness with CBS and Turner Broadcasting is for how many years and how much money? It's 14 years and it's $10.8 billion. $10.8 billion. That's a lot of money. We must always make it clear that in our society there is the violence of poverty, there is the violence of slums, there is the violence of inferior education, and it is a kind of psychological and spiritual violence that's much more injurious than the external physical violence uh, that we see. 14 years and it's 10.8 billion dollars. The violence of poverty. 14 years and it's 10.8 billion dollars. The violence of slums. It's 10.8 billion dollars. And it is a kind of psychological and spiritual violence. It's 10.8 billion dollars. That's much more injurious than the external physical violence uh, that we see. The madness is back. I don't care one whit about the Final Four or NCAA, but that's just one of the thousand different ways that we are burning up the world's resources. Because everything that we do has an impact on that natural world, way down beneath the technological cheesecloth.